Okay, well, welcome, everybody. I'm Dawn Hawkins with Morality and Media and PornHarms.com, and we are celebrating the 27th annual White Ribbon Against Pornography Week. It starts always the uh, first, sorry, the last Sunday of October, and our first event this week is with Anna Malika, um, a sex trafficking survivor who now speaks out on, a, on many different issues and um, to, tell, to tell her story and help people um, not fall into this trap and just understand what, what's really going on. And so we're really happy to have Anna with us. Yeah. Uh, we are going to be talking about the links between pornography and trafficking. But first, I'm going to just let Anna talk about herself. Tell us where, you are, where you're from and um, a little bit about you now. And then, Anna, go. feel free to just take it wherever you want to go, if you want to talk about your story first. Yeah, okay, all right, well thank you so much for having me, I'm so happy to be here, and um, yeah, my name is Anna Malika, and um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about where I, like, where I came from, what happened to me, and where I'm at now, and um, then we'll continue our discussion further. So, I was originally born in Calcutta, India, and um, I was adopted into an American family in North Carolina, and after um, being adopted, everything was pretty stable until I hit about eight years old and my parents divorced. And um, I had just everything went kind of crazy for me after that. Um, they, my parents divorced and my mom immediately remarried to another person who was abusive towards me. Uh, my dad we got in multiple relationships with different women and it was just a lot of instability. And they, uh, my family in America was Caucasian, and of course, being Indian, um, I didn't really felt like I belonged anywhere. I didn't have a sense of belonging. I always wanted to be white because I thought that if I was white, then I would be beautiful, and then I would be worthy of good things and and whatnot. So I had this instability over here, and then I also had this um, desire to be wanted and needed. And um, as my parents continued to marry and be remarried into middle school. I developed an eating disorder and I started really like being told by various people in my life that if I had any type of curves I was ugly and I would just cry if I had any type of little curve when I ate like in my clothes or anything like that. Um, I just hated myself so much so then my parents continued to um, remarry. My um, my dad remarried a woman who had a substance abuse, substance abuse issue and then I got into high school. By this point, you know, in high school it's all about what are you wearing, what you got, all these materialistic things and I wasn't white. I wanted to be white like all of my friends. I thought that would make me pretty. I thought if I was skinny that would make me pr be pretty. I had no attention from my parents so I felt so I didn't feel like I belonged anywhere. Well then, in high school, I was in my junior year and I got a job at a movie theater part-time. And growing up, I had always had like this, um, you know, desire for theater and performing and whatnot. And so um, at my job, I was working in a movie theater and a projectionist working there, he offered to teach me um, free guitar lessons and I was like of course and um, he was 40 I'm in high school so I'm in my late teens at this point and he just starts telling me all these things that I wanted to hear like you know Anna you're really pretty and I was like really I'm pretty oh okay and um, well you know you're really great at what you do oh really well I want to spend more time with you all of these things I had been desperately wanting to hear for so very long and um, and so I just kept getting to know him more and more and more during these things, these lessons. They became more romantic, and we began a romantic relationship. It never really crossed my mind that he was like in his 40s, and I'm a teenager. <laughs> never really crossed my mind at all. Um, all that mattered was that I wanted to spend more time with him. So um, it was um, a little bit into our. Um, guitar lessons, I got in trouble for bad behavior at home and I got kicked out of my house um, in high school. And I had nowhere to go. And he's like, well, we're already dating. And I was like, okay. You know, yeah, he's like, why don't you move in with me? And I was like, okay, that makes sense. You know, we're dating. We love each other. I'm important to him and all that. So that's what matters. So I moved in with him. I'm still in high school. 
And at this point, this is in like 2004-ish, 2005-ish year. Um, so it's, um, you know, it was really easy to get isolated. He kept trying to get me to like hang out only with him. I stopped hanging out with my friends and um, everything. It just became, my life became solely him. So when I moved in a few months into it, he asked me to be a part of his art project. And I... Um, he was like, you, you know, you could be my number one model. And I was like, oh, your number one model. Okay. He's like, yeah, my number one, my number one star. So I began this art project as very innocent first, and then it became more sexual as time went on. I was forced to do unthinkable things. I was forced to do things that are um, um, very violent. And um, he kept a catalog of these on the calendar. And I remember I was in the kitchen, and I was looking at the calendar, and um, and I was like, what is that? He's like, oh, it's just how many times we made love. And I'm like, okay, yeah, all right, I'll buy it. And, you know, he wouldn't lie to me. And then there was sometimes I would wake up, I didn't know where I would have been. And I just woke up and the, my clothes were gone and stuff had happened sexually. Um, and I just, he, I'd be like, what happened? He's like, oh, you were just sleepwalking. And I was like, okay. You know, he would never lie to me. And I went everywhere with him. Uh, we went to the grocery store one time, I remember. I was, um, we walked, I walked over one aisle without him. And he followed me, and he's like, where'd you go? I love you. Don't leave me. I want to be with you all the time. And I'm like, okay, okay. You know, because all that matters is that he wanted me. For once in my life, I was wanted, and I was told I was beautiful, and I belonged somewhere. That's all that mattered to me. And um, at this point, like, I see everybody's like, well, where, you know, like, Anna, this is weird, but it seems normal, so nothing outside looked at abnormal. Everybody just was kind of like, she seems happy. Okay, let's just go with it. Um, this, them being my friends, my teachers, my family, um, I just seemed so happy. So it seemed weird, but I seemed happy. Um, and I, uh, let's see what else happened during this time. Um, uh, I was, um, sorry, I just lost my train of, tra train of thought during that point. But, um, but yeah, he did monitor my money. Uh, I did not have any control of my finances. Every time, um, he would just, he would just keep the money when, um, everything that I had. And, um, one day he started talking about marriage very, very seriously. We did not get engaged. So let me just put that out there. We did not get engaged, but he talked about very, very seriously. And so, um, as, um, <clears throat> Sorry, um, he talked about it very seriously, and um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm blanking really quickly here. Um, oh, and so I didn't want to get married. That was like the one thing on my my mind was I did not want to marry him, but I did want to break his heart because you know we loved each other and everything. And so when um, we um, <clears throat> Sorry, I blanked for a second. Um, That's okay. Yeah. So I met another girl at my job who I knew, and she needed a roommate. And during that time, um, when we were, I was talking to her, I was like, you know, I just need a roommate. And she's like, okay. So um, during the day while I was at school, I started moving, moving, stuff, moving my stuff in with her behind the scenes. And... It was like he'd come home, he'd be like, where's your hoodie? I'm like, oh, you know, I just left it at school or whatever. And so he's like, all right, you know. And so one day um, I got fired from the movie theater, and I um, moved. Um, I just moved out of the house. I moved in with her, and it was cold turkey. I didn't really talk to him again. Um, he tried to find out where I was, and uh, but like I said, this is back in 2004, 2005 time. So there was no really um, Twitter, or Facebook, or anything like that for him to find me. So everybody was kind of like, why is this guy trying to find her? This is weird. And so um, uh, I never really talked to him again after that. But she, um, so at this point, I had thought that I was just in a, um, you know, I had broken up with a relationship or whatever. I, um, um, you know, I didn't know anything about the pictures. But so after that, I just kind of like fell into this spiral of just like drinking and partying and things like that, just oh, long term. And then um, I got a call in 2009 that 
he had died and um, of colon cancer. <clears throat> and so by that point, um, I remember I was just like, well, I need to get these pictures back. So uh, the, I didn't really know how to do that, so I went to the funeral, and I saw a family member of his, and so we went and we got into um, – um, I met up with her, and she gave me this big box, and I was like, what in the world? This big, like, what did I leave there? And so I get home, and I open it, and he had mass-produced everything. Every single of these pictures had been mass-produced. I had no idea. I had no idea I was in a business. I had no idea that he was selling these. I had no idea that he had been, um, you know, that he was mass-producing anything. I thought they were our personal art project. I thought I was his you know, his special model, and then I talked to some other girls, and it turned out that he had approached them. He was never able to go full do what he did to me, but he had also approached them as well. So not, he had been hiding all of this from me. I had absolutely no idea. So after this was over, I still didn't know what it was. Um, I just thought, I just couldn't understand the whole idea of what he had done. So then a few years later, I started hearing about human trafficking, and I was like, human trafficking? Like, you know, oh, that's just overseas and everything. I was like, it's not here. It doesn't happen to girls in the U.S. And it's just prostitution. It's just, you know, you see a girl and just walking up and down the street and she has a pimp and all this. And then I started, like, reading more and more about it. And I remember I saw, an, or I read an article and it was a girl. And her, um, her story read this. Girl meets older guy. And girl starts dating older guy. He starts telling her all these things, like he loves her, he wants to be with her all the time. And then he asks her to do an art project. And then it goes in to talk about that, how that's human trafficking. And I was just like, wait, what? Wait, I was trafficked? I thought that that was just prostitution. I thought it was just this one thing, and I thought it only happened overseas. This girl's story happened in the U.S., and it clicked what happened. I went into a spiral of just a downward spiral of more and more life-controlling issues, cutting, um, more self-harm, more self-hatred, anger, depression. So I finally decided to make that choice and enter a program called Mercy Ministries. And there I was for an estimated six months, and I learned a lot of life skills and gained a lot of restoration. And I uh, graduated three years um, from this February, so three years ago. So I'm doing really good. And um, my healing is incredible, and now I'm in the movement, and I am um, working in policy, and I'm studying um, sociology, criminology, and pre-law, and interning at Morality and Media, Porn Harm, so my life is great, but um, it has just been, it's incredible to see where I am now, and where I've come from, but there is one thing I really want to point out right now, when I was talking about human trafficking, on what people think it looks like, I actually forgot to mention a picture that I had, this picture is me when I was in it, so brace yourself. This is when I was with my trafficker, what I look like. All right, I'll, Don, I'll let you put it up. That is me. That is that scary, terrifying story you think of when you think of human trafficking. That girl you think on the side of the streets, if you're noticing, it doesn't always look that way. The girl could be right there in front of you. This is me in my chemistry class with one of my classmates in high school, and we're sitting there. Um, in my goggles, in my apron, just like your daughter's um, um, friend who is in her biology class or her chemistry class. Like, you're not on the side of the road. You can easily be this girl here in high school, just going to class with your other friends. So that was the picture I wanted to share. I'm not sure if it shared. I had it up, but I didn't hit present to everyone. So it's up right now. This is yeah. Anna in high school at the time that she was being trafficked. This is what she looked like, just any young girl. It was, you know, this can happen to anyone. That's what that's what we need to realize. Yeah, it can be anyone. And it can be anybody in any realm of your life. Like I said, consider your daughter's friend who's in her chemistry class, who's sitting next to her. That's who I was to this girl standing next to me. That, that's who I was to her. And now she actually, her and I talk, and um, she's so proud of me, but she's just like, and I can't believe during that time when I thought this guy was your boyfriend, this is really what was going on. So just something to consider. I don't know where to where to go with the discussion exactly. Um, you said so many things that touch on 
on, on what we would we often argue are some of the links between pornography and sex trafficking but um, but maybe to, to start I just want to highlight that in the middle of this you didn't even realize what was happening to you mm -hmm. and that is the story that I hear most often from survivors is, is that they didn't even realize while this was happening the the grave nature, the the scary situation that they were in, because you're, you know, I, these girls are groomed to trust the traffickers and the pimps, mm -hmm. and, and to believe what they're saying and what they're promising. And so, I think I think that's something we need to realize is that a lot of these young girls they don't even realize when they're in, in this situation. No, they don't. Not at all. Like, I had absolutely no idea. I had absolutely no idea. Not even until after I found out what human trafficking was. That's why it's important to talk about it. That's why it's important to understand what it looks like and not that it has, you know, when people hear human trafficking, they think specifically prostitution. And that is a very, very heinous crime, and it is a very important issue right now, and definitely just in general to address. But it's not the only part of human trafficking. It's not the only element of it. Pornography is a huge issue as well. And pornography is becoming more and more um, common as we expand on our media and um, just the Internet itself. Um, but it is a very, very um, key type. But I, I guess also, like, it just, I really didn't understand what I was under. I had absolutely no idea. I had no um, uh, positive parental role models or just adult role models in general. I didn't really have that. I didn't know what to look for in relationships. I didn't know what to um, see in another a, a romantic relationship as healthy. I didn't think it was weird to date a 40-year-old man. Right. For those of you who are watching, I made a mistake when we set this up. Uh, you were supposed to be able to submit questions, and I guess I didn't tick a box. And it won't let me now. So if you have questions, you can write them on the event page below as a comment. Um, and I'll keep refreshing and bring it up, and I'll be able to read them off to Anna and, and ask her. So feel free to make a comment or to write a question below on the event page. But um, moving on, so, so Anna, you, for with your situation, pornography was made of these forced sex acts that you were that you were involved in, and I mean that is this doesn't happen to um, to everybody. I mean, all pornography is not necessarily forced sex acts. But the thing with that with your with your experience at least is someone who might see those images and your trafficker was sharing these images. He was selling them, he was mass producing them, they were out there far and wide. And people who were looking at your images, they wouldn't necessarily know that you you weren't consenting, right? I mean that this is a scary thing. People who are regularly viewing pornography or Anyone viewing pornography, you can't distinguish whether or not something is a forced act, a trafficked act, or or consenting. You didn't look like you were, you know, being beaten necessarily in all of them. You, although you did say that some of it became very violent. Yeah, it did. There were certain areas that were really violent, but um, I think the biggest thing was that. Um, the way that he would try to dress me up and put me in certain certain types of costumes, I guess you'd call them or whatever, like I looked very young in all of them, I'm sure, no matter how old he and I think that's something to keep in mind too, is like when you're looking at these these girls in this um in the pornography and whatnot, it's like they some of them they look so young but they try so hard to make them look older and um, that was something else that he tried to do as well as not only the violence but like trying to make me look older and I, when I look at him now I'm like I know I look and Anna yeah. how old were you? Um, it, that's the thing is I don't know the age of when it started but I know I was no older than the age of 19 right so, so it's likely that these images were taken when you were a child so and before you were oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I definitely I met him when I was a minor for sure yeah yeah. So, 
I mean, that's a that's a whole nother subject. Um, you know, people who are who are viewing pornography, a lot of pornography now is like advertised to be young. I mean, that's the the like taglines to get people to click on it is like these are really young girls they don't know what's coming like they say I'm not gonna read off tag taglines from pornography because it's so disgusting but the viewers of pornography are being are cult they, the pornographers are cultivating a taste for younger and younger mm -hmm. performance yeah. and and many of those watching that's what they're demanding is younger and younger and with, you know, your your trafficker was was helping to provide what the demand is asking for. Yeah, and something that um, Don and I had spoken about before the webinar was how, um, and this is something I've never really talked about in a, um, an event before, is my trafficker had a huge addiction to pornography. When I remember the first time I went to his house, he had, um, his house was really tiny, but the bedroom was three-fourths full of bookcases of pornography. Huge bookcases full of it. Just every type of pornography you can think from soft porn to more hardcore porn, um, you name it. Um, I didn't watch it, any of it. I don't, maybe a little bit I was forced to, but like I remember it was there so his addiction made him even more susceptible or like desensitized in his mind as far as the, pe the woman in it, in it to the point where he's, I remember he would be like, well let's do it. These girls did in this video and um, and so those were kind of where he would get his ideas is from the pornography he had already watched so his porn addiction was fueling his drive to um, to exploit me uh, so that's something else important to take away from with the pornography industry as far as my situation is concerned it was rooted in that I do not know if he had any child abuse growing up or anything like that or any other sexual abuse but I do know he had the addiction yeah I mean that's something that I hear often from from survivors is that that pornography is often brought to them and they're asked to act out what what the Johns or the pimps have seen in pornography mm -hmm. fulfill this kind of fantasy. Yeah, yeah, and I mean it's just yeah, it was terrible. And also, um, there was a. I won't say the show because I don't know if I'm allowed to say what it was, but it was a show that he would watch on television, um, and um, whatever him and this other friend of his, when they watched it and they liked on it, I had to do that. So they also got it from um, the, I don't know, the sexualized media as well, what to do in the pornography. So it's like all just the sexualized culture in general influenced all of that, but um, it was mostly the pornography, but they got it from both that as well too, what I had to do. And what would you say to other young girls who who maybe, you know, feel a little lower self-esteem or unsure of themselves or or maybe, you know, don't have that support network that we all crave? What what would you say to them? Mm -hmm. I say that every single person struggles with it to in some certain way. There's nothing wrong with you. Because I always thought I wasn't worthy of asking for help, or or I didn't think I was ever capable to be helped. I didn't think there was any way to help me at all. Um, so um, you can always visit the um, Porn Harms website, and you can contact us for like different tools. Um, you can read more about the StopTraffickingDemand.com page as well, but. For um, if it's a girl and you're not capable to kind of read about all these different things to read more on off of this issue specifically individually, if you're in school, talk to like um, you know a counselor. If you're struggling with issues like I did, um, or a teacher or whatnot, are you talking about that type of situation? Or are you talking about just like struggling? Are, is that the kind of area that you're speaking on? Yeah, yeah. Those who might be yeah, um, but yeah, I would talk. Sorry, go ahead. Those who might be more vulnerable to, you know, to believing a guy like this. So what? what oh, okay, yeah, yeah. I would definitely um, learn what a healthy relationship looks like. Um, I think we all, all women, love to have that man after us. They love, we love to be pursued. Um, I know I do. I have a wonderful boyfriend. Finally, I have a keeper. He's in Waiting to like 
once you see what that looks like, really wait for the follow through. Through. Don't just go be like, I know society now, especially in the media, if you get like a Gucci bag really soon after you meet a guy, that means that he's a keeper. It doesn't always mean that. He could have other motives. Like really get to know the person first. Learn what these healthy relationships look like. Get mentored. Get a mentor, somebody pouring into you to kind of show you what that looks like. Like for me, my parents were really great in different ways, but when it came to relationships, they could not offer me that. Um, so find someone to show you that looks like show, um, just to mentor you into a really uh, into your dreams, into your goals, into your ambitions. Um, so you can build that confidence because you don't need to have to have a man to be confident. But if you do want to have a relationship of some sort, you need to get healthy within yourself first before that can happen and before you can understand what that can look like. So um, that's what I would say as far as like that is concerned. Anna, um, Jessica asked a question for you, and I have the same question. Is, yeah. Is there any way you can think of in which someone could have helped you during this time? Yeah, that, I get that question a lot. Um, I guess because, like, I mean, I had some people were just kind of like, I guess if anything, someone could come in and really be that person to say, you are not doing this. Kids are kids. Your Kids are there to be protected. We have to protect the kids. We can't expect kids to protect themselves. They're not mature enough and adult enough to do it on their own. So that's what makes them kids, or else we would consider them adults. So um, if anything, like, I know I probably wouldn't have listened very well, but I do know that if someone would have come in there and explained what human trafficking looked like, I would have been I would have seen that this was completely wrong. So I think if anything, talking more and more to other people about what human trafficking looks like and um, what is not a healthy relationship and um, just really coming in because I have people tell me like this is kind of weird, but to hear say, hey, this is what a trafficker does to groom you, meaning trying to get to know you to like brainwash you, that's kind of what groom means. Um, I think that was what would have had to have been. Um, that probably would have helped me, but other than that, I don't know what else would have at that point to keep me from going into that situation. Uh, another question from Sarah is, were you ever scared that this man would come find you after you left? No. That is a really good question, actually. No, not at all, because I had no idea what was going on. I just thought I was in a relationship, and I was just a really strong-willed girl who didn't want to get married. I just, I knew it was weird, but I didn't understand how wrong it was. And I knew that, I, I just didn't understand it. And so I never was really afraid. I just didn't want to break his heart. Um, so, um, yeah, so there was never any um, fear like that at all, no. I, I think you bring up a, I mean, that's a good point. I, as, a, as an outsider who has studied a lot about sex trafficking and been in touch with many, many survivors, is you felt so emotionally attached to this man that you felt bad for leaving him. And I think that's, that's mm -hmm. often a problem and one reason why it's so hard to get out of these situations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's really weird. I look back on it still and I kind of laugh. I'm like, I'm just kind of like, wow, I really did feel that bad about that. I had no reason to feel bad at all. But yeah, it is It is really weird that I did. I felt very bad. I felt very bad. I felt bad for breaking his heart and um, I thought I lost the love of my life. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, how has it been since you discovered all of those pictures out there. I mean, have you been able to, to do anything to track them down to to stop them from being shared? I, I That's know. a really great plus question. I'm glad you asked that. Um mine was done um through a um how do I say this? A printing company, I guess you'd say, like a office printing company. They have stores and whatever and they he did it um I don't it was so long ago. Um I'm not aware that he put anything online, but um, so from what I could find, I didn't have to get anything offline, but 
I think I got the majority of them back. I'm not aware of where he sold them at or what he did as far as like where he sold them to, but from what I I've got back as many as I think I'm able to get back. Um, so yeah, but I mean I actually tore them all up. Um, part of my healing process, except I kept two. Um, and um, but I tore all of them up. They were, gosh, there had to have been over two thousand pictures. There had to have been. Um, so I tore them up years ago. I was very proud of myself. It's a very big moment for me. Yeah. Um, is there anything else you wanna you wanna share at this point? I think we've covered. I mean, I I was gonna ask you a lot of questions about like the theories and what the research says, but we don't need to cover that because your story. I mean, your experience. You lived it. We don't have to talk about the research. You've lived this. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, I guess the main thing, I'm one of those statistics that people, I always do this, it's so funny on the screen, um, but I'm one of those statistics, but um, I guess one of those real people, it happens to you, I guess, keep in mind, these are real people, these are real people behind the cameras, these girls you see on the camera, these boys you see on, on the cameras, these are people, they're not just numbers, they're not just some, and they, I mean, most of the time, they're probably not willing people who are willing to be there. That's how it's trafficking. They were forced um, or brainwashed into these. Um, and like I said, I never kept any of the money. So just keep that in mind going forward as you learn about what pornography is. To keep in mind that these people in the cameras are probably victims. They probably did not want to be there. They have a hope and a future too. And it's if they can't fight for themselves, it's up to us to fight for them. We have to give them that voice. And if we choose to not understand new things, learn new things, um, or do anything, nothing's going to change. So we become the steps that we take, and if we do nothing, nothing will change. So it is imperative that moving forward that we learn, look at all different aspects of the issue, um, not just going into and saying, okay, it's on TV. What can we do with the TV? Or, oh, we can do this with the movies or whatever. Look at all the different issues and make that choice to move forward in a positive way. Because one person started my program where I got help, and I have been able to feel joy at Christmas for three years now. And this, actually, this will be number three. And so I'm very excited about that. And, you know, and I have a great internship, and I can wake up and, like, smile. I have a great relationship and things like this. So one person started that program, and my whole life has changed. So now you have a bunch of webinars this week where you could be that one person that could learn that one piece of information that could change someone else's life. So, um... You don't have to do something huge at all. It just comes down to making a choice to move forward. That's my main thing. Thank you, Anna. I just want to tell people that they can find you. She, Anna has a public Facebook page. It's just Anna Malika, M-A-L-I-K-A. -A. And it's on Facebook, and she's on Twitter. She's very active. We are so happy and grateful and blessed to have your participation um, as an intern right now at Porn Harms and Morality and Media and we um, we hope to, to help help strengthen Anna so that you can you're already such a great um, speaker and spokesperson for this movement and I am excited to see what happens in the future and um, I'm grateful I get to work with you next to you and learn from you yeah it is fun and um, and I encourage a lot of you to just support her in whatever ways that you can. Join her, join her on these social media places. And if you're interested in learning more specifically about how pornography is is kind of related or linked to sex trafficking, we have gathered what research there is, what um, articles there are, what the experts have said into one place: StopTraffickingDemand.com, and um, and and some stories as well. So we encourage you to go there. But Anna, thank you for your courage and your boldness to speak up. Thank I know you. it's not easy. Um, you're you're incredible. And I think we might end. Let me check the let me check the page to see if anybody has any questions as we are ending. Um, Okay, here's a good question, another one from Jessica is, maybe, and I think this is a good thing to end on, um, but, but Anna, what, if anything, would you say to guys who look at pornography? 
Ooh, man. <laughs> um, that you really should examine why you're looking at it. Um, that, like, really examine why. Are you looking at you think it's really okay? You really think it's okay to do this? I would also ask, like, get them to examine their heart on that, but also examine, do you realize that these people are real? Do you realize what you're looking at? Do you think that you should find pleasure in looking at a girl being forced to do something um, sexual in nature, watching her on TV is something that's okay? Like, should that be acceptable? So kind of processing both of those two things would be um, that. Is why are they doing it? And do you really understand what is going on and that is real? And that it's hurting somebody? Thank you. That's a, that's a very powerful message. Um, well, I just want to thank everyone for joining us. And again, you can follow Anna, Anna Malika on Facebook or Twitter. Or just contact PornHarms.com and we'll connect you. Um, but Anna, thank you. And we will I'll hit the stop broadcast button. I'm sad that it's All right, thank you.